Good morning, my renegades. Welcome back to Rogue Radio. My name is Sarah Jane, and today is Persecution Press. Yes. We haven't done those in a while, and I'm, you know, at home, bored, and I think it's time to to do this, so, yeah. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please reach me at the links down in the description below. And if you want merch, click the link. Buy yourself something nice. Okay. <clears throat> The website has kind of changed since the last time we have um, read from it, but I found something for us to read, so. North Korean Christian woman escapes sex trafficking in North Korea. Chun Yi uh, was born into a comfortable and secure family by North Korean standards. Her father was a military officer and her mother was a housewife. Since family background largely determines um, the future for North Korean citizens, her family could expect a good life. In 1995, however, just a few years after Chun Yi's birth, uh, North Korea experienced the worst famine in history. Millions died of starvation, and even though her father was a military officer, Chun Yi's family received only two fistfuls of corn flour each day, not nearly enough to feed a family of four. In desperation, um, they gave up on dealing with the black market, but um, the extra corn flour that her mother and uh, had obtained from a relative and sold illegally still barely provided for their family. Any North Korean who survived that time period is a living miracle, Chun Yi said. North Korea's or North Koreans had to break the law just to eat a meal. Um, state security agents would confiscate anything they uncovered um, on the black market and eat it themselves. Oh yeah, that's fucking selfish. I'm sorry. (laughs) That's terrible. Um, The famine was just the beginning of Chun Yi's suffering. Her parents died when she was in her early teens and soon after their deaths, when Chun Yi was 15, her sister got married. Not wanting to be be a financial burden on her sister and brother-in-law, Chun Yi decided to live on her own. Um, her only option was to earn money illegally. Aww. The North Korean government intent on confiscating money that people like Chun Yi had earned through the black market announced that a currency reform in uh, 2009. So citizens were given one week to exchange all exiting currency for the new currency and um anything exceeding a maximum amount set by the government was confiscated. Uh, While many who had saved more than the allowable sum lost their money, Chun Yi managed to avoid financial ruin and keep her illegal transactions undetected um, because she wisely had been trading only in Chinese currency. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, yeah, before I go on in this story, I want to say that, um, some people in foreign countries like this, they don't have a choice whether or not to go into sex trafficking because they can't, they feel like there's no other option, so they have to earn money, they have to make a living, and it's sad because the government won't allow them to make a certain amount of money, or else the rest of it is given to the government, and it's, it's awful what's going on, and I'm sure it's still going on to this day in some circumstances, in some, you know, countries and everything, 
and I don't believe that anybody should feel like it's their last option to sell their body, you know, for money, but it happens. <sighs> um, in 2012, when Chun Yi turned 20, a friend uh, invited her to come along on a business trip to the Chinese city of Changbai. On the China-North Korea border, her friend, who visited China often, had told her about people she, uh, she had met there, uh, including Deacon Jang and Pastor Han Chung Yo. And uh, during her visit in Changbai, the women stayed in Deacon Jang's home while there Chun Yi noticed a picture on the wall of a cross of a man, or and a man, Jesus, holding a, a sheep. What? Oh, okay. Oh, I see. I see. It's. I had to actually look at the picture. <laughs> uh, there's a cross on the wall, and then there's a picture of a man holding a sheep. Who is Jesus? Okay. Um, the house felt different to me than other places. She said. Another curiosity to Chun Yi was the Bible she saw sitting openly on the bedside table. It was the first one she had ever seen. I just opened it, she said. Out of curiosity, I did it, but I was really a fool. Sees a Christian Bible becomes a political criminal. I heard from people that anyone who smuggled or brings a Bible, even if a smuggler didn't know there was a Bible in a box, they are sent to concentration camps right away. Wow. After opening the Bible and touching the forbidden pages, she began scanning the text. You know how, You know it is so awful that certain countries and certain governments in those countries will actually scare people into believing that the Bible is dangerous. This child, or this woman, I should say, that this woman really thought that touching the Bible or even reading it would send her to jail and it's just it's not just a book and I'm sure the reason why the government has decided to make these rules in order for people to stop you know smuggling a Bible like I'm sure they know the impact of the Bible, so it's not just a book, but to people who are outside of Christ, some people will just see it as a book, like a forbidden book that they can't really touch. They're not allowed to touch it. They're not allowed to read it. And it's so, I don't want to say it's silly. It's not because this is true. This is all true, but it's saddening. Like. The government is afraid of a holy book. The government is so afraid of the holy book being read and touched by people that they have to make rules like this. And at this time in China, the Bible is forbidden. It has been forbidden for a while. There are tons of people that risk their lives just to smuggle Bibles over the border. And I mean <laughs> to me that's very brave. It is it's very brave. I wish I could be one of those people because I don't know, to me that would just to see someone's face light up when there's a Bible given to them, it's like giving them the secret to eternal life. I mean, it <sighs> To think that there's governments out there that won't let the people read the Bible. It's crazy. I mean, here in America, you're allowed to read any book that you want. Even a satanic Bible, if you really want to. There's even people out there that, are, that have the will and have the right to destroy and burn Bibles and deface them. And here... There's so many people 
in different countries that just want just a page of it. And here we are, destroying the Bible. That's nuts. I felt like the Bible um, came into my heart even though it was my first time reading it, she said. Just hours after she had she and her friend um, reached Deacon Jang's home. Pastor Han arrived and immediately started sharing the gospel with Chunyi, um, offering reasons why she should place her trust in Jesus Christ. The whole thing made me very nervous because what we were doing was illegal by North Korean standards, Chunyi said. I avoided looking at him and instead. Uh, read the Ten Commandments that were printed on the inside cover of the Bible. The crosses in the home terrified me because I knew that being in a place with that symbol could cause me to be sent to a concentration camp when I returned to North Korea. That is insane. Like, even the shape of a cross is threatening to some people because it's like, if you're in that home, you could get arrested. After listening to Pastor Han and reading the words in the Bible, however, Chun Yi could not understand why the North Korean government hated Christianity so much. Christianity seemed to be telling the truth. At first, I thought Christianity was a superstition, but when I saw the Ten Commandments, I realized that if uh, everyone in the world followed them, uh, we would all be very happy and the world would be a much better place. Chun Yi <clears throat> learned more about God by reading the book of Genesis, the trees, all nature. I didn't know that God created all of this. The concept of a creator, um, God, is new to North Koreans, um, whose understanding of creation is limited to the theory of evolution. In addition, the North Korean view of reality is purely materialistic. So the idea of an unseen god is incomprehensible. Sharing the gospel with North Koreans, therefore, um, often begins uh, with the book of Genesis, which sets the groundwork for the faith in an unseen but real god. As Pastor Han began to tell her more about Jesus Christ, her body shook with fear. Oh my god. She knew that it would cost her uh, if the North Korean government found out she had placed her faith in Christ or even heard the gospel. The following day, Pastor Han returned to Dick and Jing's house uh, to speak with Chun Yi again. He wanted her, he wanted to tell her as much as possible about Christ before she returned home. Um, at that time, I felt much better because it was the second time uh, to see him, she said. After four more hours of teaching, Pastor Han uh, placed his hands on her head and prayed for her. I felt uncomfortable, Shun Yi recalled, but uh, when the pastor prayed for her for protection crossing the border back to North Korea, um, she said that she felt peace. Um, before Shun Yi and her friend left uh, for their North Korea, or back to North Korea, uh, Pastor Han... Um, talked more about Christ and how to find uh, peace. He he told us whatever we have or whenever we have a difficult time to pray like this and we need to look for God, Jesus. He's, uh, she said, okay, the pastor's teaching never left her. Pastor Han explained to me that God is a creator and God is listening to our prayer, she said. So, Whenever I had any difficult times, I always began to pray, Lord, please help me in this and that. Without recognizing that um, I was praying, I naturally came.
came to pray. <clears throat> Chun Yi uh, would need to remember Pastor Han's words in uh, the days to come, as she and her friend began began her their dangerous return to North Korea. Her friend warned her to stay quiet about uh, their visit in China. Shortly after Chun Yi's return home, North Korean state security agents rounded up several hundred people associated with Pastor Han and Deacon Jang's ministry. North Korean spies um, had traveled to China, pretending to be interested in Christianity, and acquired the names of North Koreans who had met with the two Christians. Um, the friend who had taken Chun Yi to meet them was among those arrested, and under the stress of interrogation, she gave authorities Chun Yi's name. Aww. I don't know if I can get mad at her, though. I really don't. Because... I... I don't know. <laughs> See, like, if a friend sold me out... I mean, it's different when it comes to the faith in Christ, because usually Christians, they... They do get persecuted no matter what, so I don't know if I would get mad in that situation if someone sold me out like that, because in the end, both of them would suffer together, and they would suffer for Christ. I mean, it's a whole different language when someone gets persecuted, because um, it's their faith that is being tested. It's um, it's hard to explain to someone who who doesn't understand persecution because persecution in a martyr's eyes or a or a true Christian's eyes they see that as a good thing they see it as this is an opportunity to share the gospel with prisoners and with people who are arrested and with even the people who arrest them like the endless possibilities of persecution and how they get arrested and everything and persecution is very painful it is life-threatening and sometimes people do die and they are killed that you know they end up being martyred but the opportunity that comes with persecution is what uh ultimately kind of shows the person's real intent when it comes to sharing the gospel and stuff like that like that it's like it's not like they have to prove anything to god it's just uh it's kind of like the last level when you meet a, the last boss it's i don't know it's hard to explain like i said like persecution in a christian's eyes is a good thing because if you think about it, Paul was persecuted. John the Baptist was persecuted. If you think about it, this is in the Bible. And, it, and it's still going on. But anyway. Uh, Chun Yi's worst fears were recognized uh, one morning when state security agents arrived at uh, her sister's house where she was staying. Still wearing her pajamas and slippers, um, Chun Yi sneaked out through the kitchen and ran into a nearby friend's house where she borrowed clothes and shoes. She told her friend that she had to leave suddenly because her sister and brother-in-law had gotten into a fight. Um, Chun Yi's sister tried to stall the security agents, but eventually they realized she was lying to them and called for reinforcements to help them. Uh, search for Chun Yi in nearby homes, but Chun Yi was far ahead of them. Oh, wow. Uh, using her sister's ID card, um, she had boarded a bus heading for a relative's home two days away, where she would hide until she felt safe. After several months, Chun Yi decided it was safe to return home. The government had not abandoned its pursuit of Pastor Han and Deacon Jang. However, in November 2014, North Korean state security agents abducted Deacon Jang in China and imprisoned him in North Korea. They're allowed to do that? That's crazy. Months after this, his abduction, this, is, this story is a lot longer than I thought it would be. And so I think that, I don't think I'm not, I'm not able to 
like read more than 10 but we'll see um let's see months after his abduction state security agents arrived at chun yi's home and told her that deacon jake had been arrested and uh they pressured her to testify against him claiming he had discussed over overthrowing the north korean government yeah no the gospel of jesus christ is is overthrowing the north korean government that that's interesting but okay while she admitted to visiting Deacon Jang's home, Chun Yi told the agents that she hadn't heard him say anything against the government. The agent kept assuring me that uh, nothing bad would happen to me if I just gave them the statement they wanted. Hmm. Manipulation. Brainwashing. Um, but I refused. I was really afraid at the time, but I think that ever since Pastor Han had prayed for me, God has always taken care of me. Several years later, in 2017, one of Chun Yi's friends persuaded her to go and return to China for an opportunity to make money. Um, when she arrived in China, Chun Yi learned that her friend was a sex trafficker who sold North Korean women to Chinese men as wives. Um, having no knowledge of Chinese and no way to um, escape back to North Korea, Chun Yi said, or Chun Yi and six other women had no choice but to await her sale in, to Chinese men. So, that whole thing about, you know, women having no choice to, but to sell themselves, it does not apply to this story, so I apologize, but it does happen. But North Korean women are often targeted by sex traffickers who, res who deceive them with promises of money-making opportunities. Stuck in China, um, some have been unable to contact their families in North Korea for more than a decade. Yeah, the whole business of sex trafficking, and I hate saying that it's a business because it's selling people against their will. Even if they were willing, I mean, people should not be bought and sold. That, that's modern day slavery, but um, they will not leave any loose ends when it comes to um when it comes to a person who's being bought and sold and they want to see their family and everything they they won't lose they won't I don't know how to explain it I'm sorry I'm still waking up but they won't leave any loose ends so if one of them escapes somehow they make it impossible, almost, to escape this hell. They will actually hunt down this person and kill them. Because they don't want anything getting out. So, this is how bad sex trafficking is. Like, they will hunt down this person to the ends of the earth just so that they don't blab to the government and like expose the trafficking ring that they were in and they will drug them of course um because that is just a form of manipulation it's a form of you know getting someone to do what they want them to do um and especially if like someone is sick they'll probably bring in a doctor that is part of the sex trafficking ring and if that doesn't work, if their treatments don't work, they will ultimately kill them because taking them to a hospital is too risky. So this is real. This is real fucking shit. But Chun Yi was the first woman in the group to be sold to a Chinese man. Wow. Fortunately, Chun Yi's husband and family were kind to her, which is rare in sex trafficking. More often, North Korean women are abused by their Chinese husbands and are forced to stay in hiding to avoid detection by Chinese authorities who routinely return them to North Korea for arrest and persecution. Wow. Despite her husband's kindness, Chun Yi was troubled and refused to eat. Eventually, after contacting some relatives who had escaped to South Korea, she managed to escape from her husband and his family. Surprising. Surprisingly, when uh, they returned, 
or when they learned of her escape, they wired her money to ensure that she could buy food and arrive safely to South Korea. Chun Yi uh, never forgot that Pastor Han had what Pastor Han had told her. Uh, during her escape from China, she prayed to God, Lord, if you are real, then make my journey safe going to South Korea, then I am then I am going to follow you. Wow. After a long journey to South Korea, Chun Yi was sent to a resettlement center where North Korean defectors were taught basic life skills to help them function in South Korean society. While at the center, um, she learned that Pastor Han had been killed. Oh my god, that, that, I don't know Pastor Han, but that broke my heart. I don't know why. It, it's, that hurt. <laughs> My anger toward North Korea increased because North Korea had killed such a good man who helped a lot of North Koreans with food and money. Um, she said, I felt like I was seeing the real face of my country. Um, she tried to help North Koreans survive, or he tried to help North Koreans survive. What was his crime? Uh, while at the resettlement center, she also thought about her Chinese husband. Uh, she was a sin he was a sincere, honest man, and he had taken care of her despite the fact that she had purchased her, that he had purchased her. Ugh. I'm getting tongue-tied. Um, it was so painful for me to leave him behind, she said. Eventually, he was able to join Chunyi in South Korea, where he too became a Christian. Aww! Yes! <laughs> uh... He goes to church with me and his, and is go and is getting to know God more now, she said. Uh, though Chun Yi's husband does not speak Korean and she is still learning Chinese, they are committed to building a Christian marriage. They attend Voice of the Martyrs Underground Technology Discipleship training program in Seoul, and a Chinese translator helps Chun Yi's husband understand the lessons. Holy moly! They attend Voice of the Martyrs Underground Technology Discipleship Training Pro. Yo, listen. I just want to say, Voice of the Martyrs is like an underground government. My god. <laughs> like, yo, it's it's like an underground Christian government for, for persecuted Christians to go. I'm just like, yo, this is great. How do I get involved? Like, how do I become part of... A voice of the martyrs. I want to know. Can can help me? I I really want. I really want to do this. As Chun Yi considers the difficulties she has faced in life, uh, she now sees how God has intervened and drawn drawn her to Himself. I am grateful for everything. She said, "I will be grateful um, if God uses my husband." Uh, and me in any way. Um, she also prays that her isolated homeland of North Korea will be open for the gospel. Um, North Koreans need to know uh, quickly, she said, as quickly as possible. They need to know um, the truth. Uh, <clears throat> they should know who the creator is. Chun Yi is especially grateful for the way God used Pastor Han and Deacon Jang to reach her in the gospel. She asks Pat, hmm, she asks Christians around the world to continue praying for Deacon Jang, who has been in prison since November 2014, and for the families uh, of both Deacon Jang and Pastor Han. The Bible says we are surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses. You're gonna make me cry, Chun Yi. There are, <laughs> they are part of that cloud, and now is my hour to faithfully run the race for which Deacon Jing and Pastor Han first trained me for. Yo, girl, why did your story just wreck me? <laughs> I can't. That's beautiful. I'm so happy that she is 
at least safe now and she is helping spread the gospel and everything that that's amazing like she is a bad ass <laughs> anyway we're gonna go on to the next story Yeah, I think we'll have only a bit of time to read one more story, just because that one took 29 minutes. But, um, let's see. Child survives FARC attack uh, and becomes Red Zone pastor in Colombia. Oh, my god. Um, as the sound of gunfire grew, a 10-year-old Louis... Luis? We're gonna call him. I don't know how you pronounce that. We're just gonna say Luis. Um, and his brother ran to their room and crawled under their bed. They knew the gunfire meant guerrilla fighters from the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC, um, were again attacking their small village um, in one of Colombia's red zones, particularly dangerous areas. When soldiers from the Colombian army arrived to repel the attack, the guerrillas took the uh, boy's father hostage to aid their escape. Um, although they released him four hours later, fighting between guerrillas and government forces dragged on for days. Many of Luis's friends were killed in the attack. That's heartbreaking. Like, a child should be... should have the most innocent childhood, you know, and here this child is seeing his friends die. I hear Hopper. <laughs> Sorry, I hear Hopper. You hear him? He's such a good boy. Anyway, um, using his savings, Luis bought books, games, and other items to distribute in his old village, uh, which rem remained under threat. Uh, he also knew New Test- he also brought New Testaments and gave them to everyone he met, including police officers, soldiers, and guerrilla fighters. I told them, Jesus still loves you despite all the pain you have caused, he said. He was scared, but I thought if I died- I'm sorry, I was scared, but if I thought if I died, I died with Christ. So he is a Christian. He he was brought up in a Christian home. So um, as an adult, Luis serves as a pastor in an area controlled by a parliament paramilitary group. Um, he assumes members of the group attend his weekly church services, listening to what he says and reporting back to their authorities. Um, and he knows they could decide he is a threat at any time and give him a 24 hours to leave, as they have done with many other pastors. I'm not scared. It is my passion, and I, I have a call from God to preach in these high-risk areas. I desire to keep on reflecting. Uh, keep on reflecting Christ. That's crazy. I, I love that when a child gets really, really passionate about God like that. That's the purest type of passion. That's the purest type of calling and purpose. Uh, Lewis has a special heart for others ministering in difficult areas. Although still young, um, he already facilitates training for pastors working in the red zones a 10 year old child is teaching other pastors who are probably twice his age how to minister to people uh, that just made me so happy oh my god Listen, I'm not sure how much time I have on this, but I really want to read this one. So, <clears throat> North Korean border guard helps smuggle Bibles in North Korea. <clears throat> Once fearful of even seeing a Bible, a former North Korean border guard now embraces it. 
Um, let's see. Nearly every day for 11 years, Park Jin May uh, dutifully monitored North Korea's border with China from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, he watched for North Koreans attempting to um, defect or smuggle uh, contraband into the country. Uh, Chin Mei took pride in his work as a border guard, um, even though he was guilty of the same illegal activities for which he arrested others. Um, like many North Koreans, he relied on illegal smuggling to simply survive. Yeah. When another guard reported Chin Mei's smuggling ring, he spent 60 torturous days in prison, and he hadn't even smuggled the most dangerous item into the country, a Bible. Yeah, okay. Um, those who let the Bibles into North Korea had a more severe punishment than someone who just kills people, Chin Mei said. For Chin Mei, getting caught smuggling meant being reduced from a respected soldier to a worthless prisoner. For the first ten days, he was forced to stand in a bowing position and was allowed to move only to use the restroom. Wow, so he had to just sit there bending over for however long, they said. Ouch. Um... If he moved, even during the night, he was beaten mercilessly with wood, with a wood pan. Oh my god. For the next 50 days, he was forced to remain uh, in a position of his choosing, but he said even sitting for 24 hours straight became very uncomfortable. Sometimes, as time went on, it was more comfortable to be beaten, he said. Oh my god. You see, North Korea is very notorious for all the tortures, like... They come up with the most insane torture techniques. It's it's crazy. You, you think of, like, Chinese water torture and shit, but this guy had to stand in a certain position for however many days, and if he moved, he would be beaten. Despite the punishment he suffered, Chin Mei returned to smuggling as soon as he returned to work. Financially, he had no other choice. One day, Chin Mei agreed to help a woman from his village smuggle a shipment of DVD players into North Korea. Really? Oh, yeah, no, that's right. Okay, from what I know about North Korea, there's only like two channels in North Korea. So when they smuggle stuff like that it is contraband so that's right because the dictator they only have like one or two channels for people to you know watch and it's all about like the military it's all about what the dictator's doing Kim Jong Ul is that his name I'm pretty sure and it's all about like the government it's all about military it's all about stuff like that um I want to say it could be a news channel, which can be kind of, it's not, I don't want to say boring, but I mean, if you watch it day in and day out, it's probably torturous. And I can understand, like, smuggling in DVD players to watch a movie just to escape the awful, like, tyranny of the government, because who knows what would happen if they found a DVD player in someone's home. Like... That's nuts. But yeah, no, that's right. Because I remember that there's like only maybe one or two channels in North Korea where people can watch. And to watch that all the time. I mean, that's brainwashing. That's brainwashing a whole country. But uh, smuggling a shipment of DVD players into North Korea, knowing he could make money in the deal. When... The woman arrived at his post with 30 boxes. Chin Mei opened a random box to give the appearance of inspecting the shipment. But the box he opened happened to also contain six Bibles. Yee! Here we go. 
Um, suddenly his heart filled with fear. Although he had never seen a Bible before, he had been taught that they were uh, subversive to Jush? What's Jush? The North Korean religion. Oh, okay. That requires worship and subservience to the Kim family. Kim Jong-ul has his own fucking religion? That narcissistic blowfish. What the hell? I could have said blowhard, but he kind of looks to me like a blowfish. So, there you go. Anyway. Uh, he was torn about what to do. But he finally uh, decided to let the Bibles pass. We didn't see anything today, he told his friend. You and I, we keep the secret until we die. Um, North Korean border guards must follow strict protocol when they seize one or more Bibles. They are forbidden from opening a Bible and must report them to their superiors before enduring 10 days of interrogation. Chen Nei's new guards, who had been through the process, and uh, he also knew that he could be killed of if another guard had seen the Bibles and uh, reported him for following their story. For their entry, sorry. Um, let's see, they know that the Bible is the enemy, he said, of North Korea's border guards. Um, it is something uh, they choose to avoid at all times. I wouldn't even dare to open it because of my Jush, I think that's how you say it, ideology. Um, after Chin Mei finished his mandatory military service, he decided to flee the country. A friend who had fled to South Korea years uh, earlier had occasionally told him about life there. Um, and Chin Mei uh, decided to experience it for himself. Yeah. Um, I will have to say, like, I can't really speak much for South Korea because South Korea has their own ideologies and everything. But it, it it is completely different from North Korea. I'm pretty sure everybody knows that. But um, one evening in September 2017, Chin Mei was in his early 30s, set out across the border and had sworn to uh, he had sworn to protect with years of experience as a border guard. Um, he knew how to cross without detection. He was not afraid of being caught by the Chinese police, he said. Um, Chin Mei um, had arranged for his sister in China to pick him up at a certain spot in the other side of the Yalu River. So once across, he went to her house where he stayed for a few months. Um, he then spent time in southern Korea, or China and um, and Laos before settling in South Korea where all North Korean defectors are able to obtain citizenship. That's nuts. I, I'm astounded. Like, that's the process of just to escape North Korean dictatorship. After arriving in South Korea in November 2017, Shin Mei underwent a standard three-month entry and interrogation at the National Intelligence Service um, to ensure he wasn't a spy. He also entered counseling, and the man who counseled his group of defectors was a Christian. When the man asked Chen Mei if he had ever heard of God, he replied, I believe there is no God. Later, however, he began to consider that the counselor had told him what the counselor had told him about God. He was then given eight books in Christian apologetics, which explained various cases for the existence of God in the historical validity of scripture. Um, he soon became interested in the Christian faith. How, or after um, his release from the NIS, the, or he entered a settlement center for defectors where he spent another three months 
uh, learning about life in South Korea. North Koreans at the settlement center are encouraged to choose a religion to help them navigate their own life. Um, or, yeah, so Ch- so Chin Mei decided to attend a church service to learn more about Christianity. Okay, we're almost done with this, so hang on. He volunteered at a church to help set Bibles out before the worship service, and as he placed Bibles on the empty chairs, Chin Mei realized he was holding the very book that he would have gotten killed for in North Korea. Um... I was so joyful. I rejoiced at being able to set out the Bibles. That's incredible. Like, mm-mm. Like, again, so many years of being in fear just by looking at the Bible, knowing that the Bible was being smuggled into his home country. He's sitting there, passing them out, setting them out on the chairs for people to read during service, like, that would give me joy too to be honest you have a freedom that nobody else has in North Korea like nobody else in North Korea could have that freedom and I know he's in South Korea now but like imagine somebody in North Korea doing the same thing how much trouble they would be in but during this three months at the settlement center He never missed a daily prayer service. His love for the church and the scriptures continued to grow until he eventually rejected the Jewish religion and placed his faith in Jesus. I know he only, I know the only way I could survive with South in South Korea was to stick to God. He said, just grab him whenever he goes. I'm sorry. What in the world? Just grab him wherever he goes. I kept that in my mind uh, whenever I read the Bible. I didn't just um, read it like any other book. I read it and I took every word of the Bible into my heart. Chin Mei also saw God answer his prayer for an older brother who had who had called from North Korea asking for financial help. After telling his brother that he had no money to help him, with his business, he began to pray daily that God would provide for his brother's needs. After ten days of prayer, he learned that a friend <clears throat> had led his brother to uh, let lent his brother the amount that he needed. Wow! Um, I prayed, and God answered my prayer. I began to know God or know how God works. God hears my prayers. Chin Mei also met. Um, a voice of the martyr worker at the settlement center and he is now receiving help from VOM as he starts his new life in South Korea. He asked people to pray for North Korea and pray for him as he um, adjusts to a new country and new way of life. Uh, many North Koreans battle depression as they adapt the adapt to a completely new way of thinking and interacting with others. I can imagine, because all your life in North Korea, you've been, you know, brainwashed to believe in a certain way, and to talk, and to think a certain way. There's limitations on how you live. I can imagine, because when, like I said, I've said this uh, about uh, the Montauk Project, and how when someone gets traumatized or brainwashed so much and somehow that brain will shatter, the mind will shatter and then it gets reassembled during brainwashing. So that's exactly what North Korea is going through little by little um, especially when it comes to torture and it's like, it's trauma brainwashing and that's exactly what Kim Jong-il is doing and I have no respect for Kim Jong-il, and I I just can't. I don't. There's no reason for him to do that. But, um, yeah, he's basically traumatizing the people of North Korea into believing that Jesus is not the way, and that in order for a good North Korean citizen to be a good citizen, 
is to follow these rules that are completely unrealistic and impossible to follow. That's why so many people are being tortured. And it's wrong. So I can understand, like, the whole life that they had before they came to North or South Korea. Their life, their way of life has been shattered, so they have to readjust. And also, having that time to reflect that they believed in the lie that Kim Jong-ul has kind of, like, made for them, it'll anger them, it will depress them. Of course they're going to be depressed. Of course they're going to be, you know, wondering why in the world this happened to them and, and why the why North Korea is the way that it is. But as he faces these new challenges, Chin Mei has hope, something he had never had in North Korea, and he finds his hope in Christ, the central subject of a once feared book that has led him to a new life. That is wonderful. I'm so happy for him. It's time for a break. Hello, my renegades. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer, and when hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download your Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's a lot of fun, so come join us. So, for some reason I can't find the the persecution map, because it's like a world map and I can like type in any type of country and they'll have like a story from that country, but for some reason I can't find it. Um, I used to have it bookmarked on my phone, but it's not here anymore. So, I am going to talk to you guys about the difference between hostile and restricted nations. So let's see here if I can. What are the hostile areas and restricted nations? So restricted nations, Voice of the Martyr uses the term restricted nation to describe countries where government sanctioned circumstances or anti-Christian laws lead to Christians being harassed, imprisoned, killed, or uh, deprived of possessions or liberties because of their witness. Um, Also included are countries where government policy or practice prevents Christians from obtaining Bibles or other Christian literature. Um, Christians in restricted nations often also experience persecution from family. So uh, community members and or political groups, uh, which Voice of the Martyrs refers to um, as acts that are hostile towards uh, Christian witnesses. So restricted nations would be a country such as China or um, Saudi Arabia or even Egypt where they have rules like that. So um, hostile nations, Voice of the Martyrs uh, uses the term hostile area to identify nations or large areas of nations where governments may um, attempt to provide protection for the uh, Christian population, but Christians are still routinely persecuted by family, friends, neighbors, and political groups because of their witness. So that means they're literally being hunted like animals and being killed and stuff like that. So their churches are being burned down. So uh, hostile areas such as India and um, Mali and uh, I want to say Ethiopia. I don't think Ethiopia is on here. (laughs) Or um, Indonesia. Those are like the most hostile nations uh, in the world right now. So just for your, you know, 
understanding of what that is. Okay, I think this will be the last um, story. So, this is a teenager forcibly married to a 60 year old man. Wow, okay, so this is from Voice of the Martyrs Canada. So, Sitara Arif, a 15 year old Christian girl, was kidnapped on December 15th in uh, Pakistan. Fesa, Fesa. Labad. Faisalabad? I can't say that word. I'm sorry. In Pakistan. Um, abducted by the husband of her employer. She was forcibly converted to Islam when she married uh, to her captor. It took almost two months for police to finally register a case against Rana Tayab, despite uh, repeated pleas uh, from the girl's family. According to Sitara's father, Arif Masai Gil, the teenage girl provided domestic services for Nil N- Nalia uh, Ambreen, who is employed by the government as a school principal. Because of her uh, government t- pres- position, Nayla and her husband have considerable influence over the police. Ha- Therefore, uh, when Arif tried to file a police report, it was outrightly rejected. Additionally, Satara's family members faced uh, repeated acts of intimidation in an attempt to force them to drop the the case. Um, The police only responded to the kidnapping after the advocacy group uh, Minorities Alliance in Pakistan was made aware of the situation on February 3rd and demanded immediate action when the authorities raided the home of the accused Muslim man, his wife, uh, handed police a certificate uh, indicating uh, Satara's marriage to Rana. The couple claims that Satara had converted to Islam and married a 60-year-old man of her own free will. Um, Akamal Bhatti, who serves as the chairman of Minorities Alliance in Pakistan, um, stated that being... <sighs> I'm sorry stated that young teen girls from minority groups are targets of forcible marriage because their families are generally poor and do not have the resources to fight in court. We are continuing to build pressure on the officials nonetheless so that the authorities could not or don't slack on their responsibility, he promised. According to a 2021 report from the Forbes magazine, at least... God, I'm not on the clock today. Listen, excuse me for a minute. (sighs) No. I'm not even allowed to hang up. I forgot to turn off my work phone. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, I don't work today, so I'm not supposed to be getting calls. Anyway, turn that off. Okay. My bad. We're gonna just continue this. It's just Sarah being awkward. It's okay. Anyway. At least a thousand women from religious minorities are forcibly converted and married annually in Pakistan. The numbers are likely much higher since many um, causes or many cases are unreported for more reports on difficulties being um, encountered by Christians in Pakistan. Wow. <clears throat> from Cuba hopefully I can squeeze this in so communist rule is in, is 
instituted under Fidel Castro's leadership from 1959 to 2008. Religious activity in Cuba, religious leaders are reluctant to say anything that could be um, construed as opposing to the government in the fear that they will face repercussions such as the denial of permits from the Office of Religious Affairs. Evangelical Christians have reported harassment, fines, and arrests for um, conducting public gatherings. According to most religious groups, however, there have recently been um, some improvements. Religious activities are met with less opposition when people are able to import more religious material. And while the construction of new religious buildings have been largely denied, many existing churches have undergone extensive repairs, essentially amounting to new buildings being erected in existing foundations yet to accommodate the growth of Christianity um, and overcome the country's restrictions on the building of new uh, facilities. There are undefined numbers of house churches um, being established, likely numbering the thousands. Uh, Pastor Omar Good Perez, we're just going to say Omar or Perez, of the Apostolic Reformation has consistently been an outspoken opponent, opponent of government policy. On October 30th, 2012, he issued an open letter protesting restrictions on his pastoral activities and the government's refusal to grant him um, an exit visa. He also protested the three-year incarceration in false charges. Finally, on January 31st, in 2013, Pastor Omar was, uh, or and his family were granted asylum in the United States. Wow.